1988 was a busy year for gaming giant Konami. Many hyped up titles like Super Contra, Hyper Sports Special, and the long-awaited Gradius 2 were ready to go fresh off the assembly line. Rearing to leave the competition in a steaming pile of space dust from the Big Viper's thrusters. Not all those releases were treated like classics though. With games like Checkered Flag, Hard Puncher, and today's review, Thundercross, being pushed into emulation limbo for years after their initial release dates. Until 2007, when Thundercross was awakened from stasis and brought back to life by the collaborative efforts of Hamster and Konami. And again in 2019 when it was featured in Konami Anniversary Arcade Classics, where it was one of the highlighted titles alongside the mainstreamers like Salamander and Twinbee, which is what piqued my interest in reviewing it. Konami chose to put this game, which I barely heard of up until this point, on the same pedestal as games like Gradius, which any casual gamer with a passing interest in retro would be well aware of. There's usually a reason for anything making it onto a compilation, and since I already had the anniversary collection, I figured, what could possibly go wrong? Let's see what all the fuss is about. So, I fired it up when I had the chance, sat down, and grabbed some popcorn for the ride. minutes later, I realized I struck gold. Thundercross is a bona fide Gradius game in all but name. Considering the similarities in game structure, I wondered why this wasn't explicitly Gradius 3 at first. Then I remembered Salamander didn't follow the conventional Gradius power-up system, opting to experiment with new features instead. Thundercross continued experimenting rather than sticking to what worked so I firmly believe that the Gradius title was reserved for more traditional Gradius games that played closer to the original. That out of the way, I'm going to try to explain why you should play Thundercross all these years later. You know how this goes down if you played any other shoot 'em up before. When bootleg Char Asnabel from Mobile Suit Gundam has a bone to pick with your planet, you gotta prove that nothing will get under your skin by fighting the Black Impulse Army and their hordes of disposable robots. By this point, Konami's stellar staff had seven years of experience refining tightly structured stage-based shoot-em-ups starting with Scramble. Thundercross hits every checkmark for innovation within the genre. Two-player cooperative play, seven stages of non-stop alien assaults in varied environments, and six weapons of mass destruction to choose from. All wrapped together with a new experimental power-up system to set it apart from Salamander and give it a pair of legs to stand on if anybody separates Thundercross from Gradius. It's a not-so-secret formula for pristine shoot 'em up science. Hard-boil that in the beaker by adding in a hair of fine pixel artistry, and you just can't lose. In plain English, the game's just darned good. But what makes Thundercross and the rest of this series so good? Most of these games look identical at first glance. You fly to the right and shoot shit! Well, my friend, for a game to stick out in a genre as simplistic as this, needs two things. Both of which the vast majority of Gradius games have. Some form of depth to keep the game from being a glorified overhaul of Scramble, and polish, mechanically and visually. That's where this franchise shines brilliantly, no matter what decade you're discovering it in. We'll start with the basics, since they're the building blocks the entire rest of the game is built upon. Of course you're going to be zipping to the right, wreaking havoc upon the enemy army, listening to those sweet sounds of metallic destruction which are loud, chunky, and satisfying. Some of those cream puffs are as orange as a nice can of Sunny D, letting you know how important they are. That's where Thundercross's primary gameplay mechanic comes into play. Destroying those brightly colored enemy formations will reveal power-ups for you to collect, which cycle through various letters representing option, speed up, and most importantly, the three selectable weapons available to you at first. These power-ups are automatically activated once you collect them, like in Salamander. But in this game, you have the power of choice to switch to whatever tool's best for the job as long as you can time it right. You can choose between a Vulcan Cannon that allows you to fire more shots on the screen at once. Simple, but highly effective. 
boomerangs that can travel through walls freely and rebound off of surfaces, which make mincemeat out of highly congested areas without much maneuverability. And last but definitely not least, a tail gun that can fire in two directions at once, which is an absolute godsend for the last stage. Or anywhere else you find yourself assaulted from behind. The boomerangs might be slightly overpowered since there are many areas with obstructive walls in this game, but the important thing is that all the weapons are good and they have their time to shine above the others. So what we've got here is a shoot 'em up that combines the simplicity of Salamander's simplified controls with the strategic element that'll make more difficult segments in a game easier if you think things through. The hallmark of Gradius game design that sets it apart from all the imposters. It doesn't end there either. If you're fully powered up, you'll gain access to the three hyper weapons, which will override what you're currently using with a super destructive subshot that can melt bosses in a matter of seconds if you manage to carry them all the way to the end of a level without depleting their ammunition. A barrage of nuclear missiles covering the entire screen in Michael Bay explosions, a sizzling flamethrower that lasts a good long while, and a devastating Kamehameha at the palm of your hand. If you're feeling extra cocky, you can take those uber weapons and refuse to use them, flaunting your superiority over the enemy and turning all the power-ups into huge point bonuses, and even extra lives if you last long enough without firing them. Creating an engaging risk and reward system that can make the rest of the game easier if you've had enough practice in the earlier segments. Die-hard players see Stage 1 more than anything else in the game. By giving you a reason to challenge yourself and make an easy stage more interesting, the repetition of restarting is lightened. All these mechanics give this game excellent depth. Finding the right balance between frantic dodging and strategic thought ensures the player's mind will never go numb. Thanks to Konami's valiant efforts to modernize shoot-'em-ups, the genre became so much more than a simple game of whack-a-mole in the short seven years Konami's been flushing them out and making them more satisfying. Which leads us to the second most important aspect of any game, its visuals. Arcade games fought against each other in a highly competitive market, with every game out in the open veering for players' attention. Without the internet, it wasn't as easy to find information about a game you wanted to play. You needed to make a good first impression on casual passerbys. You could have the best gameplay in the entire world, and there's a good chance the public would have ignored it if it wasn't visually appealing. The extra pressure put onto artists and developers to make their games look as great as they played made the late 1980s a second golden age as far as I'm concerned. Thundercross is no exception, but it needed to do something to differentiate itself from the rest of the Gradius series. The vast majority of games set in the Gradius universe take place in the far reaches of outer space, which let you visit each planet on the way to the enemy base briefly. But none of them had you staying on a planet for an extensive period of time. The entire game takes place on the planet Heniabu, which lends itself to flying around in locales you didn't see in any other Gradius game before. There isn't a single space stage in this entire game, which works in its favor because that allowed the team to branch off into environments inspired by our own planet. Including, but not limited to, dilapidated civilian cities which were unprepared for the relentless alien onslaught, underground resistance bases with strange spurts of energy flowing out of the gaps in the floor and the ceiling, high-tech scrapyards with unstable machines breaking into pieces which could destroy the cockpit of your ship, and the obligatory R-Type battleship that's so large and in charge that you spend the entire stage trying to take it down. Okay, maybe that last one isn't as original as the other venues I mentioned, but come on! Who doesn't enjoy dismembering a gargantuan warship piece by piece, Star Wars style? If that wasn't enough, the timeless pixel art is backed up by a phenomenal soundtrack composed by series veteran Seiichi Fukami and newcomer Junichiro Kaneda. You'll never forget tearing up the battleship with this Power Rangers rock egging you on and encouraging you to bang your hair. Have a listen! It's astonishing Thundercross is able to maintain the same level of quality throughout the entire mission. All those elements put together, you have a damn good game on your hands. 
but you're probably wondering how fair or accessible it is, considering the Gradius series' notorious checkpoint recoveries. What happens if you die? Well, you lose everything when you die, but you instantly respawn right where you left off, giving you time to clear out more dangerous enemies while you're invincible, or rack up some damage per second if you have a few extra lives to sacrifice. Little do you know, the power-up order is actually rigged to help you recover if you die at any point throughout the game. The icons will stop spinning and you'll always get an option first, followed by a speed-up if you died anywhere except the first level. This arguably makes Thundercross recoveries even fairer than Salamander because you're always given exactly what you need when you need it the most. Which is exceptionally generous compared to most games released back then, period. Thundercross also lets you continue as many times as you want, so you can either see the game through to the end, or practice the stages to get a better handle on what to expect out of it. With one exception. You can't continue on the last stage. This was more than likely done to encourage players to come back and hone their skills by putting more money into the machine. Because Konami was still skeptical about allowing you to cheese your way through the entire game. The logic there was that by making you work to see the ending rather than letting you take the lazy way out, the game would have generated more lifetime revenue for the operator from the die-hard players that want to save the world. That might not have been a very profitable idea since it didn't hang around, but to us players, it meant that beating Thundercross was more of an accomplishment than your average game. It doesn't matter nowadays, since modern re-releases on Nintendo Switch, PC, and PlayStation 4 have save states, so you can practice each individual stage. But once you're familiar with them all, I highly encourage you to try and finish that last level without continuing to see how smug you feel afterwards getting your money's worth out of it on the home console releases. Thundercross gets an A-plus for being another amazing entry into this beloved series. Before I sign off, I should mention that I've been playing the European and Japanese versions of Thundercross throughout the review. The US version of Thundercross is considerably different, and it's also included in the Arcade Anniversary Collection, so we'll take a brief look at that. Many Konami games had minor alterations to them in the United States to optimize their monetization. But this particular game was radically altered under the presumption that we wouldn't be able to understand weapon switching and more complex game mechanics. So, two of the power-ups were removed entirely, and to compensate, we get a screen nuke they bizarrely call a Little Baby. As useful as the Smart Bomb is, it's not a replacement for the tail gun at all. You're unable to destroy the enemies in the last stage efficiently because you can't even destroy them the second they appear, making this ordeal way harder than it needs to be. Maybe it encouraged more people to give the game a try, but when you compare it to the original unedited version, it feels like a huge chunk of the game is missing because the strategy that was there gave the game nice, juicy meat. Without weapon switching, it feels shallower and less engaging. By all means, that doesn't make it a bad game, but there's no reason to play this version when you got the Japanese version side by side. I'm glad it was included in the Anniversary Arcade Collection as a curiosity, though. It's a piece of history that reflected the thoughts the developers and the publishers had about the US video games market at the time. That'll do it for me today! I hope I was able to spread the word about this great game to anyone stumbling upon my video. Make sure you leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed what you saw, and I'll do my best to bring you monthly videos about the best games. Until that time, take it easy out there. This year's almost over.